you probably can't even see this fully in the picture. How does a company like Lego, and this is a rocket made out of pure Lego, just so you know, how does a company like Lego use design sprints at scale? Find out in this video. Oh, I'm kind of scared that it's gonna fall apart. <laughs> so recently, on a trip to Tokyo, I got to sit down with Ike Brandsgaard from Lego, and we got to talk about design sprints in detail. Lego was really a pioneer when it comes to integrating new innovative systems into their company. And in this clip from the Product Breakfast Club podcast, you're gonna get the deep dive into how they did it and how that runs today at Lego. So what you're gonna hear is a clip from the podcast, you know, one segment that we think is pretty important. So not gonna waste your time anymore. If you have any questions, put them in the comments. Really hope you enjoyed this one. Here is my interview with Ike Branskoa from Lego. And we're running this interview at Ike's Hotel in Tokyo. So occasionally you will hear people walking around in the background speaking. I really hope you enjoy this. You can find Ike on LinkedIn if you write in Ike Brandsgaard, B-R-A-N-D-S-G-A-R-D. And I'm sure he'd be happy to answer questions about how Lego use design sprints internally if you have any follow-up questions after this podcast. Hello, Ike. Hello, Jonathan. How are you doing, man? I'm fantastic. Let's actually get into one of the main reasons I really wanted to chat to you. I think it was the period of April to June. April to May, early June. April to May, early June 2017. This is when I guess like a huge portion of the Lego internal agency paused yes. everything that was happening yes. and decided to figure out new ways of working. Maybe let's go back to the start because companies don't usually do that. Like, it sounds like a super dangerous thing to do. Can you tell me, like, what was the reason that this pause happened? The company has for 10 years just had a tremendous success with double digit growth. And not a lot of companies experience that. We had some idea why that happened, but some of it was also fortune, I suppose. So we had 10 fantastic years. Then we could see this starting to slow down a little. And then uh, we did some uh, research. We used big data and did a lot of interviews and digging into this. And we found out that we were probably being uh, too uh, formulaic in the way we did our communication. We basically just did it the same way over and over again and did not really reinvent ourselves. And then uh, we had this idea that if we wanted to change that, we just we needed to do something very different. But if you do something for 10 years, it becomes a habit almost, right? And it's really hard to break out of habits. We got a new uh, boss of the agency, a French guy with a lot of courage. When I was there a few weeks ago, just to use the words of your colleagues, they said, René has some really big balls. Yes, absolutely. So, <laughs> he didn't uh, say courage, just so you know, I'm just telling yeah, you. <laughs> but it's, it's his French and it's French, right? So it's courage. Okay, okay. Yeah, I like that. So uh, <laughs> his name is uh, Remy. He persuaded uh, his leader peers that we needed to take this break to actually make this happen. What was from his perspective and from your perspective, why was the pain so big to actually convince the leadership that you have to stop? Was it that you guys felt like if you didn't really stop, you wouldn't be able to break the habits, you wouldn't be able to innovate? Is that the reason? Yes. So he had been there around a year at the time, I think. He couldn't really figure out how to stop the organization from doing what it was doing. So where's the handles? How do I do this? We tried to do it in smaller ways, but it didn't have enough impact. I think the metaphor he used was, this is a train that's running, how do I stop the train? And I think this is probably pretty much, you know, the emergency brake, you just pull, and then you stop the entire train, and then something happens. If you guys hadn't done this pause, if we're looking over the next 10 years, do you think the patterns would have stayed the same, and this would have caused more struggle, and like, what would have been the end result of that, of this not changing, I guess? I think we would still uh, change, but just at a different pace. This was a step change. This was kind of a revolution. So if we haven't done this, it would be more of an evolution. Of course, we would keep up, but we would probably lag a little behind all the time. And now this was actually an opportunity to get a little ahead of the curve. So you guys stopped. The pause happened in 2017. And you and your colleagues were kind of given a, let's say, a task, I guess, to figure out as the agency, how can we actually work in the future? Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> it was actually a bit of a crazy meeting, that one, because 
My very good colleague uh, Henrik and I, we were called into the office of Remy and uh, one of the other uh, leaders of the agency and told that, so guys, we're doing this thing, uh, we are going to call the pause. So we're going to take a break for uh, two months and then uh, we need to look at, at how to work differently. And you know, you guys, you have been working with these iterations and this agile stuff. So we want to do something similar like that. So are you up for that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Super excited. And by the way, so you know, uh, we want this done uh, in nine days. We will pull the break in nine days and then you guys, you will just make sure that 200 people, they work in iterations in some way. And had it been four years ago, I would just have ran out of the office and said, never, ever, this is crazy. But uh, we've done a similar thing a couple of years back when we introduced something called Scaled Agile Framework. It's an agile process where we took a lot of people and just from day to day almost kind of made a change like this. So we were like, all right, we think we can do this. I mean, we've seen it before, so we think it can be done. We just need to find the proper method. We went back to our drawing board, talked to a couple of other colleagues who have done different agile design thinking uh, activities. And then we agreed that, okay, since we are going to have so many colleagues who have never ever done anything agile on a regular basis before, we need to basically teach them and make them super comfortable about how to do this. Stuff like uh, Kanban and Scrum and just bigger picture of uh, design thinking and teaching them the principles of that. We didn't think that would be the right way. We thought it would take them too long to kind of become good at it. Usually when you work agile, you need four or five iterations before it becomes comfortable. Right. And then uh, you, you improve from that and then we would be done with the pause. And then uh, the design sprints seem to be the perfect thing. We've been doing uh, design sprints a couple of times. And then we thought, to use your words, Jonathan, it's a recipe. You are really instructed exactly how to do this. And then we, uh, of course, started with uh, Jake's book. We picked out some facilitators who could do this for us. Somebody who was used to facilitating and could create some kind of structure around this. So we actually chose a lot of project managers, had them uh, read the book, and then they basically got three days to get ready to do this. We created a more detailed schedule for them that you can find in Jake's book. So it's like, okay, so you will meet at 9 and from 9 to 9.12, you will make the introductions from 9.12 to 9.15, you will show the first video from uh, Jake and so forth, just to make them feel uh, comfortable about this. And it worked. You chose, you know, a couple of project managers that were going to be facilitating these design sprints. Yes. You and Henrik read the book first. What made you choose the design sprint? So it was that it was uh, so well-defined that it was a recipe. So it has the iterations built in, but also it's really uh, like an instruction manual on how to do this. And what we had learned, maybe we have done a handful of these before, was that when you do a design sprint, there are some things that feel a little out of place, a little awkward, but it doesn't really matter because very shortly after, then uh, the clock will uh, beep and then you just move on to the next exercise. And the sum of everything you do in the week kind of produces an output that have worked for us. If you look at, let's say, using the sprint process compared to using, you said you guys had been kind of doing some design thinking-y things before. Why not just, I mean, you already mentioned that the reason was you wanted like almost the minimum effective dose, the thing that would work the fastest with the least amount of effort might be the design sprint. What is the reason you didn't maybe just go with design thinking? Because at least from my perspective, most large companies of the size of Lego would have actually gone the design thinking route. Henrik and I, where we come from is digital. So we've been doing a lot of software development. So it's actually less design thinking we had, you know, under the skin and experience with. It was more uh, agile practices within uh, software development like Scrum, Kanban, Scale Agile Framework. We had some colleagues who also knew about uh, design thinking and we knew that some of the principles in the design sprint has the roots in, uh, in design thinking. I also knew about uh, IDU and some of the stuff they've been doing. But it also seems like this is something you need to practice, right? It's a set of principles. And you start with these, and then you kind of need to find your way. I mean, Henrik and I, what we think is interesting is the process, not in itself, but what it can do to people to help them achieve whatever they need to achieve. Where the people attending some of these things, they're much more focused on an output. They need to deliver something, right? That's valuable to the company, a product, a concept, a campaign, something like that. And if you select design thinking, you would also inherently kind of need to reflect about how you're working, right? We just wanted to focus on the stuff they needed to do and take the overhead of thinking process away from this. Of course, they needed to learn it and get familiar with it, but at least they should just trust the process was really one of the main trances. It's like, guys, 
don't uh, challenge this. Don't uh, ask too many questions now. Trust the process. Run through a week, and then we can discuss when the week is done. But you need to kind of have all of it. Then you will see what it can do for you. Did you notice a difference between how people felt about doing it on the Monday compared to how they felt once they had the prototype on Friday? Yeah, of course, they were a little anxious going in on Monday. A lot was actually super excited, right? Because they could see the same pattern. It's like, all right, we're doing the same thing over and over again. And it's not completely Groundhog Day, but at least we know what we are doing. And usually when you get out of your comfort zone in a nice way, then it's exciting, right? So you don't know how the week is going to end. You're going to meet some new colleagues you probably never worked that close with before. And you're working on something you haven't worked on before. So I thought that part was interesting. And most of them just played along. And I think that's the only requirement you need from somebody is that they want to play along. I think an advantage that people in the agency had compared to, if I think of some of our clients who are trying to implement the design sprint into their company, one of the reasons that people push back against it is because they don't have the opportunity to pause and try it out. When we're trying to implement the design sprint, they're trying to crush it into their everyday work as well. You know, at the end of the day, then they have to do all their emails and they actually have to do their real work. And I think it's not that they don't want to do it. It's just that they don't have the permission from the top down to say, look, we want you to really try this. You're absolutely right about that one. It's not time you need to carve out from everything else you do. You you actually need to be allowed to do this. It's focus, right? You can take a lot of theories about queues and waiting time and stuff like that. But it's waste, right? You take that out of the equation because you're so focused in a week. And that's why it works. And your managers need to support this. So we also had a rule that either you're in or you're out. So it's not like you are in for two days and you're out for two days. That doesn't work. Then you're not in. And we had enough people in the pool to kind of choose from. And then we would just reduce the amount of design sprints we will do within a week based on how many people could commit 100% for the sprints. How many sprints did you have running at the same time? So we had uh, up to 10 running uh, Whoa. each week. So, <laughs> Holy uh, crap. Yeah. So I think at the end of it, we had at least 60 sprints. And now we've done 150 maybe. Wow, that's insane. How did you choose the projects to actually run the sprints for? Yeah, so that's actually the thing the book doesn't tell about, right? So... Damn it, Jake. Sorry, Jake. Don't <laughs> buy Sprint. This is kind of like a design <laughs> Sprint at scale, right? right? When you do it this much. We quickly found out that the bottleneck was really not, you know, the sprints and getting people on board themselves. It was actually digesting and processing the output from the sprints and preparing the input for the next sprint. So we would create something we ended up calling the control tower. So they kind of looked at all these airplanes, all these sprints flying around to make sure they got off the ground really well and they also landed again really well. And they would prepare the brief for the sprint teams. We did a presentation for this group of people at the end as well. To the extent we could, and that was most of the time, we would do the testing because it's super valuable. But then in addition to that, we would actually make a presentation for this group of people and tell them what did we do during the sprint. What did we learn? What was the prototype? What did the testing say? What is our recommendation to have now? We also needed to kind of stagger it a little because we would just take the output from one sprint and then put it directly into the following week. But that meant that if we saw the demo on a Friday, we would need to get ready for Monday. It was not possible. It was crazy. And if you uh, are looking at eight to 10 different teams uh, presenting their stuff, you are having a fantastic day, right? Because you're seeing all this awesome stuff coming out from a lot of clever people. But your mind is just exploding at the end right. of the day. So how do you kind of cope with this? You, you simply need time to think about this and then consider, okay, so what is the next step we're going to take from this? We also got more uh, organized. Usually what happens when you do iterations like this for a a period of time is that patterns start to emerge, right? So we could also see that, hmm, we know that some of the overall uh, challenges for Lego is in these different areas. And then we could kind of take the different sprint outputs and then put them into a matrix and say, okay, now we are covering this part of our challenges and now we are covering this part of our challenges. And then we could see, okay, do we have any gaps here? Is there anything that we need to look at with these sprints and the sprint teams that they should investigate and find a solution for or a problem that should try and dig into? So that made it a lot more uh, structured as we went along. But to be honest, it's not how we started. It came as we built this thing. So the control tower, how many people were in this kind of group? Five. Five people. Were you in that group as well? This yeah, control I was facilitating tower? it. So I was not making any decisions in there. I just yeah. made sure that it took place and that we captured the outcome of it. 
So the creation of the projects, because this is a very common problem in a lot of companies I work for. And I know a lot of people will be listening to this podcast who are constantly asking me about this and how this works in large companies. How did that actually work? So maybe two questions. Number one, how was this brief created? Number two, how did that get communicated to the team who was just about to run the sprint? We had some uh, creative directors who were responsible of writing the briefs. And then we got the head of the agency, Remy, uh, approving them and said, yeah, this is the direction. So he was kind of overseeing it all. And then the teams, they got it on Monday morning when they got in there. And we had a brief template that we used. It's the one we usually do. So it's about, okay, so this is the challenge. This is who it's for. This is uh, some inspiration. And it's just a one pager. It's very simple. And we use it a little bit like user stories to take some agile comparison. So it's a conversation starter, right? So the team would get this, they would look at it, and they would have some questions and some elaboration was needed. And then they would just have a conversation with the person who, uh, who actually wrote it. And then when they were thinking that, yeah, now we are good to go, we understand exactly what the issue is and what the challenge is, now we think we can work our way towards a solution. And if they got in doubt of the route it during uh, the course of the sprint, they would just call in this person and just verify whether the direction they were taking were the right one. Often, we would also have the person who wrote the brief as the designer to make sure that they kind of got it in the direction they wanted. I mean, this is a question that goes slightly back in the timeline, but I'm just kind of shocked about this. How did you get the confidence to go and say, we will do the design sprint in this pause and nothing else? As I mentioned, we did this scale agile framework introduction some years back, which was just a leap of faith. It's just like, all right, let's do it. We need to change something. We need to do differently. So let's just plunge into it. And I've gone super confident in iterative processes over the years because you super quickly learn, not me personally, but a group of people who are doing this because you reflect on, okay, so is this working for us? Are we achieving what we want to achieve? And if it's not, what do we want to change? That's actually something we added to the sprints as well. So I mentioned that we trained these facilitators in this. I would meet every morning and every afternoon with the facilitators. In the morning, it was actually mainly to give them confidence in this. At the time, I was not an expert on design sprints, but at least I could give them confidence that I were. <laughs> right. And they should just go in here <laughs> yeah. and everything would be fine, right? So just go in there, follow this uh, recipe and you will be fine. And then in the afternoon, I would get the facilitators back and we would discuss what worked well, what didn't work so well, any questions, challenges, something that uh, you interpreted differently. And there was a huge learning opportunity for everybody, not the least me. And we would do this every day. So just take one day at a time. So when you start doing this, it's not like you need to understand everything that happens throughout the week. Just focus on the Monday, right? Have a broad idea on what you're going to accomplish in the five days or four days. And then uh, just take one day at a time in detail. And actually during the day when your team is working on things, look it up in the book and just prepare for the next exercise. So it doesn't take a lot of preparation, which I absolutely love. It's really, really like the best part of the sprint for me is the lack of preparation you have to do because then there's no excuse, right, to actually do the sprint. Right. And then we would do a more formal uh, retrospective, usually on Thursday when uh, the teams were doing uh, the prototype. Then I would get the facilitators in and we would do a one hour uh, retrospective okay, what is working really well, what is not working so well, and then organize it and say, all right, then for the next one, we will tweak this thing. And usually the design sprint itself worked super well. I think the only thing that they had a little challenge with was the map. Everyone has problems with exactly. the map. So uh, you would do it as kind of a warm ex exercise, and then you would move on and everything would be good. When you do these things, when it gets down to practicalities, you're in a good place, right? So it's like, we need more doting bots or more right. candy right? Or <laughs> stuff like that. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So the end of the two months, right? It's the, I don't know, end of May. What actually happened there? So here we kind of digested all the different sprints and the outputs. And then we did one big presentation for upper management at Lego. Our chief marketing officer and some of the team, they would come by and then see uh, some of the things we did. After that, we agreed that, all right, we're actually going to, to do this. So uh, these prototypes, these concepts, these ideas, now we're actually putting it into action. And we've been seeing some of them uh, come out uh, this year and some are still uh, in the works. Usually projects at Lego take some time from you get the first idea and until it hits the shelves, it's like uh, 18 months. Hmm. You can definitely tell that it's not purely digital. You actually need to uh, get some plastic grains and mold it and getting onto the shelves. But it's going to be really interesting to follow this. 
if you look at the amount of projects that happen in those two months, I don't know, you said how many sprints in total happen in the two months? So I think around 60. Of course, we experimented a little with this. So sometimes we would take, if one team came out with an output where we felt that, ah, we're not exactly sure it's there, then we might give the exact same brief to a completely different team. Mm. Also, sometimes we would take the outcome from one team and say, all right, guys, this is really good. Why don't you kind of polish it and perfect it and then use another sprint of actually getting it production ready? But we learned that neither of those two ways of doing it was particularly effective. It was actually the best output or outcome was when the original team just created a done deal. It's like the 2080 rule, right? So the first team who does it will create 80 or 90% of it just brilliantly. Yeah. And then you can spend another week and you will only get like 20 or 10% more and it's not really worth it. Mm. And sometimes a different team working on it would not actually produce a better result. It would just be different. So just having them work on it in one team is definitely the most effective way to do it. So after the two months, I mean, this is just less than a year ago now. What has been the change in the way that you guys now work within the agency? Are sprints being run regularly? Do teams voluntarily choose to run a sprint when they feel like it? How has it changed the way you work? Of course, we got some very concrete output out of the sprints that would solve some real issues for us. But I think at least half of what we accomplished with it was a change in the way we work. The teams are now on their own. Either they will select a point in time where they think that now it's time for a sprint. We need to get a thing started or we hit uh, an obstacle where we need to propel ourselves forwards and the sprint would be that. And I think it's the first time in my career at Lego I've seen it kind of get momentum. Usually you need somebody to drive it, right? You right. need a leader, you need a facilitator, you need some project managers, some process people. If they get out of the equation, it will stop. People usually appreciate it and like to work this way, but it doesn't kind of, it's not self-motivated. It doesn't become a habit as well. No. So I think where it caught on the most was with some of our creative teams who would just consistently do it every second week. So they would have every second week, they would do a sprint and then it will work in a more regular way, if you like. And people ask for it. It has a lot of cool uh, benefits. So I think it's a super team building activity. We deliberately tried to mix up people because we were going for a little more raw innovation. So we thought that if people not work together on a daily basis, but they come from different areas, right, they would inspire each other uh, more. And it's definitely true, they will. But the benefit for them is that they get to know some colleagues they've seen before, right? You've seen them in the coffee line, or in, but now they actually know them, right? So we could see afterwards, there was a lot of buzz of people, you know, chatting and talking. So the whole office area just got more lively after doing this. Also, um, if you are a person uh, participating in a sprint, usually you would have some kind of expertise that everybody knows and you know yourself and you would kind of be a little typecast that that's the stuff you do. When you're in a sprint like this, whatever the sprint requires needs to be chipped in. And maybe you are the person who can chip it in, right? So maybe it's your interest. Maybe it's something you aspire to do. Maybe it's something you've done in your past. Maybe it's something you do in your spare time, but you bring it into the sprint and then all of a sudden your work becomes less, you can't call it mundane, but at <laughs> least it's not as restricted. I think that's a huge point that you just made that it gathers momentum on its own without somebody having to push it. And I think it's the first time I've ever experienced that. Now, I've been working with companies for the last 10 years trying to help them with their innovation processes, product processes. And you're completely right. What would happen is I would leave and it would stop. And I think the reason, and now when I look back at it, the reason it would stop was because people often felt like the process was kind of just something they had to do. It wasn't something they necessarily wanted to do. They didn't necessarily always see the benefit. For example, when I used to teach companies design thinking processes, or you know about personas and all of this kind of thing, especially people who were not designers. So you know, the developers and the business owners would just be like, okay, uh, Jonathan's gone. Let's go back to the way we were working because this stuff doesn't work right. They didn't really believe in it. Even if some people believed in it, there wasn't enough people believing it for it to gather momentum. So I would have to keep going back and keep helping and keep helping. I was working with a sport shoe company recently. It took maybe one sprint, just one normal sprint and an iteration sprint for it to spread like a virus throughout the company. The sprint is not being pushed on them. They asked the team who did the sprint with us, can they teach them how to do the sprint now? And then it goes to another team and another team and another team. And I think that this is a huge point, right? It's so practical 
it also makes people's lives easier. I think there are some things in the sprint that don't get talked about enough. For example, the fact that discussion is removed from making decisions. Normally, people are so sick and tired of sitting around talking about what they want to do and what they should do and what's the right decision, especially if it's a creative exercise. And the sprint kind of removes these and processizes these conversations. And I think that's huge. People don't feel so tired at the end of the day. Like a nice example is when I went and visited you guys in January, one of the developers, and by the way, developers notoriously hate design processes, came up to me and like had a video that they were using, you know, one of the small cut down sections of the design sprint to do their retrospectives now so that they don't have to talk. And I think that's such a cool thing that people get excited about it, that they take ownership about it, and that they feel empowered with the way they're working by using the process. And I think that's why it's so sticky. Absolutely. Having a mix of somebody who have done a sprint before and somebody who hasn't, that's also a really good way for it to kind of spread like a virus. Right. And it works really well. And I, I just love the thought that I don't have to drive everything. I think that's the absolute best proof that this is actually valuable for the people who are doing it, which is the whole point. I mean, for the business, yeah, you might uh, introduce it and you get the desired outcome from it. But I really, really think that you have only true value if the people who actually participate in it, they want to do it on yeah. their own. It gets momentum. It becomes part of the way you actually work. We just kind of put it to the test. So here in the, the autumn, we did at Lego what uh, our CEO called a reset. So we had to uh, let some people go. Another reset? Another reset. Oh, what of the, the whole bit, company, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not the pause. It was a reset. Right. right. So we had to let some people go. We restructured a lot of stuff. I mean, it was a, the biggest change I've seen in my time at Lego. It was really interesting to see how all of this would come back together. And people are really asking for this, right? So it's like, we want more. We want more sprints. We want more teams. We want more fast decision-making. So we're not doing enough. Just before this uh, reset last year, we actually tried to say, all right, everybody agree in the agency that one week, every month, we will have no meetings. Because that would allow for two things. Either you kind of are ready to participate in a sprint, if that's required, or you just get focus to get stuff done, right? which is also what the sprint does. You're not working on a zillion different things and attending uh, 20 different meetings during a week. So that part of it works super well. But then we stopped it, and I think we need to pick it up. I was trying to be a little radical and say, hey, why don't we have uh, meetings for one week and then no meetings for three weeks? Batch so, them uh, all together. Exactly. So let's see if I can get us there. That's something that Jake, the guy who's usually hosting this show as well, he speaks about when you start a job first, you're super excited about it. Your calendar is clear. You're ready to do the creative work. You're super excited about the company. And then one meeting pops up and it's like, okay, this is the uh, lunch to catch up with this person. Then another meeting and then another meeting. And eventually, two weeks into working at a company, your time is constantly, you're switching context the whole time, right? You rarely have like four hours of just working on one thing in concentration. And I think that's also something and that's really cool to hear that one of the principles of the sprint of being able to really batch the time and really do concentrated, focused work in one context, that that starts spilling throughout the rest of the company and you start making decisions outside of the sprint that are taking principles from it, which I think is super important as well. And it works. It's just a really good feeling and you really get stuff done. So people embrace it. Do you see you guys sticking to this process for the next few years and really like making it part of your regular habit? Or do you think it's going to be something that is like the current trend and then you'll move on to the next thing? No, I actually really think this is going to stick, at least for a, a foreseeable future. The thing with a big company like Lego, things just take time, right? I mean, you have small bubbles of teams and departments within the company who are working in a particular way. So, and right now, this is really spreading throughout the company. So, we try to inspire our colleagues and tell them what we've been doing. So, and then it's kind of up to them where they, they want to plunge into it and try it as well. But it's requested a lot. So, a lot of people of my colleagues, they ask if I can come and tell them how they do this, if I can facilitate a workshop, if I can teach them how to do from this. From outside the agency also? Only from outside the agency. Okay. I've actually kind of left the agency now because the agency is kind of self-sufficient. with Right. This. There's enough critical mass. People know about it. There's so much experience in there. I can't really move that a lot. It's a high-performance team within mm -hmm. this, so I can make a much bigger difference by doing this in different parts of uh, the company. 
And it's interesting because some of our departments who you would think that this was even more uh, suited for, they don't really do it and they're really curious about it. So our huh. raw uh, product design development areas. And I also think that's the interesting aspect of it. For me personally, it's taking it from a digital environment where your constraints are different and then taking it into different parts of the organization and see how does this way of working, how well suited is it for this? Can I help my colleagues so they work in a smarter way, achieving their results in a faster and better way than they do now? So that's kind of the mission. So far, it's working pretty well. Do you still call yourself an agile coach within Lego or have you changed it to like design sprint coach now? <laughs> no, no, it's agile coach. I actually didn't used to be an agile coach. I used to head up project management. Right. I've been a project manager for my entire career. But uh, as of this year, I formally became an agile coach at Lego. But I actually don't think the difference in what you want to achieve is that big. Mm -hmm. The way you do it is very different, but not what you want to achieve. Because at the end of the day, what you want to do is to have a group of people working towards a shared goal as effectively and as fun as possible. So let's finish this off with something that maybe would help some of our listeners. Also a tricky question. If you were to go into a large Fortune 500 car company tomorrow and you had two months to, I would say, usually the task is help us to innovate faster, help us to work faster. You only have you, so you have to orchestrate everybody else. What would be the way you would start that? So first I need to get some buy-in from the decision makers, the people who have the fortune of the company in their hands, and then get their acceptance for, okay, so we are going to work this way. And then I would pick some of the most curious people about that could do this to kind of get momentum. Personally, I'm inclined to start small and let it grow from there. But right. if I look at what I've actually done at Lego, it's always been pretty massive, right? A lot Dramatic. of people in one go, it's like, boom, big step chains. And we land it on the feet every time. But from a risk perspective, it's just more risky. Yeah. But it creates the chains faster. But I still think that if you get some people on board who want to do this, it's a really good way to get started. So, And then you can choose everything between that and then just training everybody from day one and the following Monday, you're just working this way because it's built in that you learn, right? People are generally pretty smart. They will adapt. They will learn this really fast. And if you uh, take the effort to do a retrospective or look at yourself by the end of each week and then have a discussion about, okay, so how do we want to collaborate with everything we learned now and then uh, change that going forward, then you will get there really, really fast. In the course of product development in big companies, a week's worth of work is right. nothing. Right. People might think it is, as you said before, ah, but we can't uh, allocate our time to it and we need to work on our daily work. That's bullshit. Of course you can take one week out of your schedule. You probably go on vacation once in a while, right? Mm -hmm. That's also a week away from work. Now you're actually taking a week that's super focused on your work that will propel you forward. So I, I would also dare the people who either doubt it or want to do this to just do it. I mean, just plunge in. The risk is relatively low because it's a proven process. The investment you do as a company is very low, all things considered. It's only a week for a handful of people. So do it, and then we can discuss it on Friday. And if you think it's a bad idea, let's not do it anymore. But I pretty much guarantee you that this will work for you. So maybe just to finish it off, what might be interesting for companies or people listening is the reason that you and I are here in Tokyo is that we're going to be running a Lightning Decision Jam session tomorrow. Lightning Decision Jam, for anybody who doesn't know, is a very short one and a half hour approximately decision-making and creative problem-solving process, which takes the principles, the important principles of the design sprint and crushes it down into a very small workshop. We developed this at AJ and Smart as a way to show usually stakeholders what the power of the design sprint is without having them commit to the entire thing. But it actually ended up being a process that we ended up using every single week internally to get things done. What I'm amazed about is that also when I visited Lego to notice how many teams were actually using this as well, which is really, really cool. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how that has been useful for you, this exercise. Well, uh, when I visited you guys in Berlin back in July, uh, it was part of what we did in the workshop, but it was kind of a snack. It was kind of an in-between exercise. And to do exactly what you mentioned, that you can kind of sell in how a design sprint works, but it only takes you a couple of hours. It's extremely efficient in actually making a group of people making decisions. So it works very well in killing endless discussions. And we're really embracing it. Particularly, a lot of my leader colleagues really like this way of working. 
usually you will get some kind of power structure when you're in a meeting, right? Whether True. you want it or not. Usually the guy or girl with the power doesn't want that. It just happens anyways. But by using this process, because it's so much uh, silent decision making, you kind of take that power thing out of the equation. And it's generally just the best idea or the best decision that gets emphasis. And that's really good. Plus, it doesn't take several days to do it. So I've been doing this quite a few times uh, and also build it into regular workshops that has the elements of the beginning of the design sprint, not the prototyping and the testing part, but more identifying the core of the problem and then pointing at the solution that we think we will go with. And what the Lightning Decision Jam does is putting that into some really actionable items that you can do tomorrow. And it, the bias for action is the thing that's pretty important, right? Like yes. that you don't just say, oh, we're going to have a one and a half hour meeting and chat, and then there'll be some notes at the end. There's no way of ending that exercise without having solutions and without people saying, I'm going to execute that task. Yes. So it's this person doing exactly this yeah. at this particular time. That makes it super powerful. And now you just mentioned bias to action. So Lego just got a new CEO, and that's the thing he mentions. Bias to action. Let's get stuff done. And this is perfect for that. There can be a lot of chattering and talking. And when you leave the meeting, you don't really, maybe you're uncertain actually what the outcome was. Right. right. So, uh, but this, it makes it super concrete in a very short amount of time. So that's what you and I uh, will uh, be doing tomorrow to uh, take a group of leaders uh, at Lego through this. My boss, uh, the head of the agency, he really likes this way of working, the Lightning Decision Team, and just wants to uh, try it out on the leadership team he's uh, part of to see if that can help them propel this forward. I think also a cool thing about Lightning Decision Jam is that everybody can facilitate it. Anybody in, in a group of people can do it, so you just need somebody to kind of take the lead on it. So bias for action or bias to action, bias for action is the only company mission statement sort of bullet point that I've ever heard that isn't just total bullshit. <laughs> like this kind of push towards just like something practical, right? I hope that becomes a trend over the next few years because there's definitely currently this sort of vagueness when you look at company mission statements. You know, it's like about we're going to innovate. What does that even mean? It means nothing. Bias for action at least means you're moving forward. And yes. I think that's really, really important. So I think anybody interested in learning about Lightning Decision Jam, you can just Google it. I also might put it in the show notes if I have time so you can click it. You'll find a video of exactly how to do that on the internet. Ike, thanks so much for giving me so much of your time. Looking forward to the workshop tomorrow. Looking forward to some sushi and sake later. Have a great day. Thank you, Jonathan. And you too. I'm really glad that you and AJ and Smart appeared into my life. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And now please give me some more Lego. <laughs> <laughs> So I hope you really enjoyed that video with Ike Bransgaard. Um, even though if you had it running in the background or whatever, I hope you enjoyed it. Definitely go and check out the full Product Breakfast Club podcast. It's out every single Monday. There's a link in the description down below or just open up your phone and download a podcast app and type in Product Breakfast Club. So every Monday, really great episode of the Product Breakfast Club. You should definitely check it out. It's also good fun. We also have every week here on YouTube, we have a new video about product design, about workshops, about design sprints, about innovation so every week here so make sure you're subscribed and also maybe hit that bell what else do we have we also have a really kick-ass facebook group called innovation hackers which you can check out you can apply to and that's just a lot of people sharing different techniques and processes in the design world finally we have a daily vlog on instagram stories and that's at aj smart design you can find everything down in the description really hope you like this video and do leave a comment if you have any questions, we'll answer them all. Thanks so much. Have a great one.